hello everybody. <laughs> so most of you we have met in the breaks, we have met yesterday, some of the people who really made it to the end yesterday, we had a little exercise and uh, you can imagine that can, can I get? Yeah, good. You can imagine that um, I'm not presenting and talking you to death, right? I'm, um, I'm a really interactive person. I like you to make your own experience all the time because I think the way we learn is we are learning by experience. We are learning by feeling it, seeing it. We was hearing in the panels about practice, right? We need to practice. 70% of our learning is practice. Mentoring, coaching, training is just a little part, but practice is the biggest part. The topic we have is emotional connectivity. And before I go into the topic, I, I'm showing you two different introductions to me. It's both me, right? So you see, I'm a mechanical engineer from Germany. I'm holding a master degree in, in mechanical engineering. And I'm a master in uh, communication, human change. I did a five years journey to my master, my trainer, and my coach. Almost a full study, right? I am 20 years plus experience in management, inclusive founding, being co-founder of the first own company, which was called Denk at this time, design engineering consultants, getting there my first people responsibility very early, and needed to be not only the best technician, I needed to be the best people developer and motivator, because we was a startup. Right? There's not many chances to promote people, but there's many chances to motivate people. And I'm the founder and owner of the Talent Management Academy, and we have 20 plus experts worldwide, and 10 of them already certified, the next charge of certification on um, human, so uh, certified in human innovative people development will be done in August. So then we have 20 certified people developer. So this is one presentation about me. I give you a second one. I'm married. <coughs> I have one wife and one daughter. <laughs> so not three wives, only one. Um, my passion, I love people. I think everybody who met me can feel that. And I, I go fishing. You see that on the right, <laughs> with my dad. <laughs> Norway, seaside fishing. So now I'm asking you, which of these two slides is presenting me in a better way? What do you think? Who says slide number one? Slide number one? Who says slide number two? Ah, why? Pictures. Personal. We was talking in that one panel about uh, new leaders, the panel before. We talking about trust. We talking about motivation of people. And I like the whole topic really, really much. And we said, we have to meet the people, we have to sit with them, we have to work with them, we have to eat and drink with them. Of course, that's the best way of getting connected and trusted. What if we cannot do this? What if, if the team is all around the world? What if we don't have the budget to meet? We need to connect to them. And one tip I'm giving all the time to multinational companies is, let them fill out something like this create a little presentation which show their private life, which connects the people. Create a little symbol for the team. It's not the same like, like sitting in a room, but it makes the people feel they know each other. They have an emotional connection. 
So why is that so important? Let me give you a few topics that I think can show you how emotional connectivity is working and where does it come from. So let, let's first of all take a look at what are emotions. So look at this. <coughs> yeah, made it. Oh, nah, I don't get it. <laughs> well, I'm crazy about it, right? So do we need emotions? What do you think? We need emotions. Will they make a difference in our life? Of course, will they make a difference. Can we avoid them? Can we say, no, I don't want to have emotions? No, we cannot. Because the whole emotional thing is coming from an area that we are not controlling, <laughs> that is controlling us. To show you a little bit what is going on in our brain, I want to show you the little different characters here. You see, she is taking care of us that we are not doing something wrong with eating or with people. So we are not making mistakes. He is keeping us safe. Her? We don't know. Sometimes we get sadness and we don't know for, for what reason or is this a good thing to have. But here with the joy we can work, right? She is giving us fun and takes care that life is a good life. And then sometimes we have anger and it's burning us. <laughs> and we are really, really um, want something and, and uh, we are anger about somebody, right? Um, to show you what is really going on, I have a little, little movie for you. Very nice. Turn up voice, please. That's fear. He's really good at keeping Riley safe. Easy, easy, huh? Hi, back! Oh, we're good. We're good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're back. <laughs> Here we go. All right, open. Hmm, this looks new. Make it safe. What is it? Uh, okay, caution. There is a dangerous smell, people. Hold on, what is that? This is disgust. She basically keeps Riley from being poisoned, physically and socially. That is not brightly colored or shaped like a dinosaur. Hold on, guys. It's broccoli! <laughs> yeah! Well, I just saved our lives. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Riley, if you don't eat your dinner, you're not gonna get any dessert. Wait, did he just say we couldn't have dessert? That Anger. He cares very deeply about things being fair. So that's how you want to play it, old man? No dessert? Oh, sure. We'll eat our dinner right after you eat this. Ah! Right, right. Here comes an airplane. Ah! Oh, airplane. We got an airplane, everybody. <gasps> And you've met sadness. She, well, she. I'm not actually sure what she does. And I've checked, there's no place for her to go. So she's good, we're good, it's all great. And so, I, I like the idea that we have that little things in our head who's doing all that stuff on a control panel, right? I, I, I love the idea and, um, what you have seen is, is, a, is a movie from Walt Disney, which is a two hours or one and a half hour movie just about our feelings and what is going on and how we have breakdowns and so on and so on. Um, but we all know it's, it's not really like this. It's, it looks more like this, right? So we have our brain and in the oldest part of our brain, the limbic system, the limbic system is taking care of our emotions. And you know, it's the oldest part which keep us safe in the, in the stone age, right? So having fear, running away, being happy, smell at the right thing. So it's something that is faster than our brain. We cannot do anything against it. 
It's faster than any of our thoughts. It knows something before we really realize it in the outside of our brain, in our conscious brain, right? So we cannot, we cannot do something about it. So the limbic system is producing these emotions very fast, and our cortex then, the outer side, is making us aware of it. Whenever you are angry or whatever, whatever, whatever you have, the part of our cortex decides what is the connection to the limbic system and what is our feeling, our emotion now. And like we said, we cannot do something about it. The thing is, why I'm here is, I think a lot of people are not connected to their emotions anymore. Because we learn during we grow up to cover them. Look at today's world. Go to public traffic. What do you see? People with mobile phones. Oh, it's on the table. Mobile phones and earplugs. They look like zombies. They're sitting in trains, they're sitting in buses, and it's like, they are not there. You know, I have a little nephew. Okay, little. I, I should say he's already 18 now. So we went with him to, to London. And because the public train system was shut down, <laughs> we need to go to the bus. And buses in London, rush hour, means bus is slower than walking. <laughs> so you're standing in there and waiting, and then the next stop, and the 10, 10, 2 meters. And he was wearing his earplugs and looking down. We are in London. We come from Frankfurt going to London, see the city. We are in the public. We can see the other people. We can feel the life in London. We can be connected to London. And he's wearing earplugs and looking down. So what, what, are, what are you doing then? You say, you know, my little friend, take out your earplugs. We are in London. What will he do? Right? He will be pissed off because you told him to take off his earplugs. You know what? What I did was a little different. I said, I want to avoid resistance. So I said, maybe you try something. Maybe you take off your earplugs because then you can see the people, you can hear the people, and you can see London, and you can be in London and be connected to the city and to the people, and it will be different for you. Maybe you try. You, if you don't like it, you put back in your earplugs, okay? And he did. And we was in the bus, and then a young lady came down from the top of the bus and fell half down the stair in front of him. <laughs> And, and then uh, she said, uh, and he was helping, and I was helping, and then she started talking German to him, and she said, ah, you are from Germany, I, I have seen it, I'm here for, for two years, I'm in a study, I did not talk a lot of German here, I'm happy to meet you. And then she left the bus, and he looked at me and said, almost looks like you arranged this, Rolf. <laughs> right? I said, of course, this is what I'm doing all day. <laughs> I'm arranging situations like this. This is the real world. So imagine, you're in a corporate world. You are working for companies. Um, we are talking about learning. And I think um, the learning thing is, why are people not engaged learning? Some of them. We give them a goal. We tell them, this is the systems. Here you can go online learning. There you go to a training. And at the end of the day, we are doing a performance management. And then we will see how good you are. How do you like that? Who likes performance management in this way? Nobody likes that. Are the people emotionally connected to this? No, not the manager and not the guy there, right? Or the lady or whoever sitting in front of them, right? So they are not connected, not anyhow. Not connected to anything. So think different. Think about your family. Think about your friends. Think about things that you really like to do. Let me say, for example, you try to 
um, you are interested in running little uh, drones, right? And you have no idea how to run that drones with the control or to build, to build that drone. So you're not, not anyhow in flying right now, but you are interested and you absolutely want to do it. Will you ever say, if you absolutely want to do it, will you ever say, no, I have no time, I have too much work, I cannot do it? You will take every single minute of your free time to get information about this in the internet, in YouTube, wherever you go, you try to get, then you buy that thing, you build it in, this, in the cellar room or wherever, and you spend every energy and every five minutes. How many people right now on our planet are connected like this to our jobs? I said, not a lot. But I know here in the room, we have people that absolutely love what they do. And they go, they get their own education, they inform themselves, and they are absolutely want to make a difference on the world. And I think we as the audience here, we can go out into the world and then go to the people and connect with them. Connect us, connect with them. And start to make a difference. Talk with them in an emotional way, understand them. Will this work for everybody? For sure not. Will there be people doing the wrong job at the moment, just doing jobs for earning money? Of course. Can we change this in the future? Of course. The more we understand where we are and how we can connect the people, the better we can do it, right? And if it is working only for two people, fine, we make a difference. Only two people will already make a difference. If everybody in the room and every conference I'm going to and every customer I'm working to, if they get it done that only two people on, on, on their, in their jobs are more happy and emotional connected, we making a difference. Difference in elections, different on the world. Getting less stupid people um, <laughs> in, in, polit politic, in politics uh, um, being the ones having to say something, like, like uh, Donald Trump, for example. You, you should not hear that now, but my biggest friend. So let us, let us go to the place where I want to give you a practical experience. And uh, the practical experience has to do with three parts. The first part we have is our somatic is our feeling. The second part we have is our cognitive, our understanding and being aware of something. And the third part we have is the field. The field is our connection to everybody else. I explain it like this. If you know, uh, sometimes, you have relatives or friends, very good friends, where are you very, very much connected. And they are in another part of the world and you have the feeling, I need to call him or her now. And you don't know why. Then you call and they say, hey, a minute ago I was thinking about you. Or you have the feeling there's something wrong with my son or daughter and then you find out that it was happening something. I call this the field, the connection to the other people. And if we don't know the people very well, we have a kind of a firewall that we can take up and then we are not connected. And the more the people go down with their firewall, the more you can connect. And sometimes I take a walk and somebody is passing me and I can almost hear them think. And don't ask me why. I had conversations about this. Uh, it's kind of a little bit crazy, but I think it has to do with being open by yourself and meeting somebody who is open as well. And then you can almost hear people think. And maybe some of you have this experience, and we are not talking about it because we think it's a little bit crazy. And for me, still, it's a little bit crazy, but it is. It is like this. With my, my, my daughter, it, it works very well. She hates me for that, by the way because I can tell her something what, sometimes what she thinks. And she's then dead. No, it's not right. <laughs> um, so first thing is we need to be aware to be connected with all three of them. So the, the awareness is the first thing. And the second thing is 
that we need to be aware and unconscious at the same time, right? We need to know it, but at the same time, we should forget about it. It's kind of confusing, but it is helping us to be connected. And, and let, let, us go, let us go there and let us come to the place where we are coming into a coach state, which I say. The coach state means we are open for change. So first is you center yourself, and we will do that in a minute. I will, I will give you an exercise on this. Second is we are opening us to the field of awareness. Then we are mindfulness to ourselves. Then we connect to ourselves and to the larger. And we hold whatever is happening to us in a resourceful curiosity. So the question now is, with all these feelings and connection, how do we integrate this? You know I'm an engineer, right? So <laughs> don't forget. I'm a mechanical engineer. So how do we bring this to life into our companies? And um, what can we do here? And for, for this, I brought you the model of learning and change. And we hear a lot about learning. I think learning, learning is a hidden change. Because the reality is, that most of us have already behavior. And most of the changes we want the people to do is a behavioral change. They should use a model, they should think different, they should be different, they should have uh, a different conversation, they should have different things, but they have already behavior. And you see, the model says, Learning is starting from the environment and is going to the purpose. And let me explain this a little bit. So, you have a little baby. The baby is born into the world and it can do nothing. And the world is the environment, right? And then the baby starts crying. So what are we doing? We go to the baby and feed it, right? Most of the time. It's hungry, we go to the baby, feed it. And after a while, the baby realizes, hey, if not, not, maybe not conscious, but <laughs> unconscious, the baby realizes, if I cry, somebody is coming. So it's not only crying when it's hungry, it's crying also if somebody should come. So it develops the first behavior. Then with different behaviors, uh, with grandma, granddad, dad, mom, brothers, sisters, it behaves in garden, garage, kitchen. It is doing things and it is getting feedback from the environment. And by this, kids find out what they are able to do. They find their capabilities. They know, hey, I'm good in singing, and that's not me. I'm good in drawing. I'm good in gardening. I'm good in mechanics. I'm good in this. So they find out what they can do and by this, they develop their values and beliefs. And values is something, if you ask me, is there some things where you really get angry about? When somebody is doing something to a kid, or somebody is doing something to this, or somebody is not respecting time, or somebody is not respecting people, or whatever. If you get really angry about things, then it's one of your core values at the moment. Right? Then you found a core value. Values can change over life. And you have strong values. And there are other beliefs where they are limiting you. They say something like, I, I tried this already several times, it never worked. So we have beliefs that are good, and we have beliefs that is limiting us and we should get rid of them. And we have an identity, so where we know who we are, this is role understanding. And we have different roles and different identities, like a father at the job, 
like in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a community, we have different roles and different understandings. For example, I work with project managers because the management said they are not really management. We only worked on identity with every single workshop. I was asking them, who are you in that role and what kind of responsibility you have? And what will happen if you do something wrong? And who is responsible for this? And what will happen if you do something right? Who is responsible for this? And how important are you to the company? And you could see over time how they come from a, every, every time something is going wrong, I'm, I'm the one who is guilty, to the place where they understand themselves as a manager. And that they will make the whole difference of the world for the company. And that's a completely understanding of the role, a completely different understanding than they had. And we have a purpose. I get my purpose somehow when I was 40. I understand I'm on this planet to give other people the knowledge that I collected over the world. And uh, somehow this is my passion. People and, and being connected to people and, and giving knowledge and sharing knowledge. That's, that's, that's why I'm here on the planet. So, why I un understand this model in, in detail? Because if we learn, we start from environment. The reality in, in, in human development is that we want to change. And the change model says it is only sustainable if you start at least at this level, the value and belief level. And how can you do this? So first of all, we need to be connected to ourselves. Right? Second, we need to connect, be connected to the field. Third, we need to be aware of the model and we need to use the model in every learning or change opportunity asking which of my values and which of my be beliefs will support the thing that I experienced in the last two hours, two days or whatever it is. And then bring these two things together and give people a positive experience about something. And then they have a sustainable change because they want to have it because they are emotionally connected. And again, uh, will this work for everybody? No. We will have people, they do not want to learn. I, I was manager, I had performance management conversations. I, because we was a startup, I think we was very well connected. But we had people in the room when we had performance management, they say, you know, Rolf, I'm happy with what I have. I'm happy with the job I'm doing. I do not want to change anything. Should I spend money and time on the guy or let him where he is right now? Because he's happy. Of course, I let him. And I say, thank you for the support. Thank you for the hard work. Whenever you have a need, you come back to me. Right? We need to look at your jobs. We need to look on how you're doing this. But if you're doing it good and you're happy, okay, right? Don't force people to do something and push them and put money on something where you have no outcome. You need to have that own willing, the emotional connectivity, and then we can make a difference. And by this, I want to close the session with Bruce Lee. I was doing fighting sports when I was young, so Bruce Lee is one of my heroes. <laughs> and he said, knowing is not enough, we have to apply it, and willing is not enough, we must do it, right? And with these words, I want to leave you with questions to me and say thank you. For